Welcome to the Resilient Recruiter Podcast. This is your host, Mark Whitby, and I'm joined today by Edward Chamberlain. Ed is a serial entrepreneur and founder of Altus Partners, a market leader in private equity search with a team of 30 people. Ed also co-founded CNC Search with his sister, Lucy, an HR and business support recruiting firm. Both of these firms generate multi-million pounds in revenue. Previously, Ed was a founding member of Investigo, a virgin fast-track business, which grew from a team of four to over 250 people before its sale. Ed's latest venture is an ATS called Strive, S-T-R-Y-V-E, which grew out of a desire to see small and growing companies recruit better. He raised seed, seed funding of 500000 in March 2021 and launches the beta product this month. Welcome, Ed. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. How are you? Fantastic. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. Um, so you and I were chatting um, last week in preparation for this, and there's so many things we could talk about that would easily take up more than, you know, 45 to an hour. So I'm having to be really disciplined to keep this conversation on track. Um, let's start with, t take me back to 2009 and tell me the story of setting up Alta's Partners. Yeah, so I, I co-founded another business prior to that. I was a, a minority shareholder in, the, in that business. And I think there was, a, there was a couple of reasons that it w wasn't quite right for me. Um, I think probably the, the predominant reason was I had a slightly different vision of what I wanted to create to the other founder. Um, he's gone on to do great things with that business and, um, and, and really kicked on from my point of exit. Um, I think the key things were for me about building reputation and, and, and predominantly building around retained searches and, and sort of delivering exceptional retained searches and elevating that product base and what I had to offer the client and what we as a business had to offer that client. So timing wasn't great. Obviously, I mean, we, 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 all, we all now have, have gone through the last couple of years. So I, th I think 2009 is a long and distance memory, but that was obviously the financial crash. So um, it was... Uh, yes, I it, remember it, was a, it well. It was It was tough. an odd time to start a business. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, it was really tough. But I think, you know, sort of... Uh, it was it was back to basics really and, and, and sort of a chance to um readdress everything, set a new business plan and, and course and, and see see where that, that got me really. All right, awesome. So you had a specific vision when you founded the business and you you touched on that talking about reputation and retained search. But could you elaborate like wh what was the vision when you started the business in two thousand and nine? Yeah, I think at that particular time, it's it's probably what been has now been coined as kind of hybrid search. But um, at that particular time, there was in my market, especially a lot of uh, financial services clients wanting a, a retained approach, but having flexibility around um, the the way that they they manifested that search. Um, and so, Alza's partners' model was to be able to offer uh, a fully bespoke tailored search for them um, but again sort of work work a structure that that was best for the client rather than putting our needs first and that was really the premise and basis of of the firm at that particular time and and sort of second to that in the background was me wanting to then sort of layer the product offering that we had to the client again all in around that search process so how could we better that um, what could we do to make that more robust and reduce the risk for the client. And, and that was really the sort of the onset of the model. If I'm honest, initially that started off being a very sort of uh, almost contingent led business whilst we developed and built a reputation uh, and the industry that we're in private equity isn't particularly trusting of newcomers. So, um, you know, it takes a time to sort of build, not be the new kid on the block and, and build your reputation. But that was really the the, the sort of premise for what we wanted to deliver um, and then hold really deep rooted relationships by virtue of the success that we'd had um, in, in delivering, uh, delivering upon these mandates. Okay, fantastic. You touched on this idea of having a product and this is something I talk about in my coaching group quite a lot is we talk about differentiation and sort of productizing your service. So, how has that developed in your business? Like what 
are some of the elements that um, I know it's bespoke and is tailored for the client, but what are some of the elements that you put together when you're packaging this for a client? Yeah, I think we see it as a series of steps. So every recruitment process is going to be unique. It's going to be individual. And then along the way, there's going to be various different steps that you're going to take um, as, a, as a client and as end user. And it's about how we can put in place enough rigor and, and, and um, depth in, in terms of those particular steps to ensure that you get the very best individual and candidate. So it can be from the premise of the start of the search and training the, the, the interviewers on, on how to, to interview. I mean, it's one of those things that everyone thinks they know how to do, but basically 98% of people do horrendously. Um, and that's pre predominantly because <laughs> you haven't been, been, been trained. Um, it's, it's amazing when I interview people for our business and I'm saying, have you been trained? And they're, they, they sort of say, well, no, but it's just normal, isn't it? Um, so structured interview training through to kind of actually how you write the job description. So is that a biased, non-biased job description? How do you attract people to the firm through to how do you put the, the interview structure together? Then we've got testing. So um, things like testing through GMA testing, etc., cetera, um, to reduce a shortlist. Um, in that we also do sort of a, a huge amount of mapping and research into the into the market to produce the sort of transparency and then through into things like Hogan psychometrics and business evaluations um, and testing through that process and then ultimately the point of delivery um, for some clients we also coach those individuals then that we place through that sort of first 180 day cycle so make sure they bed into the business because again, the search doesn't finish when you place the individual. There's also that, that first bit of, of getting to know the business from both sides, from, from the candidate you've just placed and the, and the client themselves. So it's, it's really that. And then we constantly look and assess that and work out better ways of doing, doing, doing that process. So, you know, to, to the extent now all of our structured interviewing we do with candidates gets fully mapped and tracked. Um, and so we can sort of uh, go into a market and look at who are the best performing individuals in that market with a, with a snapshot to help the rigor again in, in that process. Fantastic. When you say mapped and tracked, what do you what do you mean by that? So, I mean, there's the old classic sort of Excel mapping, um, uh, but we, we produce lots of individual maps where we benchmark individuals based on the structured interview scores that we've, we've done. So we're, we're always scoring and assessing individuals. Um, so rather than just take notes and, um, and, and see, see how an individual performs based on our own personality type, we're trying to remove the bias out of that and actually look at the assessment of the, um, the feedback that all the the responses they've given to the questions that we've asked that are structured uh, and, and and effectively go across the board. So if we're looking at a, a, an investment director, all investment directors of a certain subset get asked the same questions to see how they perform against their, their peer group, basically. Awesome. All right. And that interview, stru the structured interview questions, um, is that following a particular framework or is it something you've developed in-house? Yes, yeah, so we've we've developed it in house based on six key metrics that we really see as the um, the most vital for that particular role. Um, they then change based on the types of roles that we're recruiting for. So we wouldn't ask a CFO the same questions as an investment director and vice versa. Um, but again, they're then benchmarks that everyone gets asked the same set of questions within their particular area of, of specialism. So it's amazing. The responses that you get and some people who you instantly warm to when you first come into an interview and then when you actually ask them these questions unfortunately they don't quite make the grade so you can you know say well uh, my initial ins assessment was they were a really warm individual and and, and lots of personality unfortunately this, the delivery of their responses wasn't you know to, to the level that we'd want and we're, we're going to give you a structure and a, and a score for how we assess that Fantastic. Interesting. Um, I'm not familiar with the Hogan um, psychometric evaluation, but I understand you guys are trained in, in that and you incorporate that into your selection process. Um, how did you come to that? Yeah, we, we just, I started, someone else actually referred me 
through to Hogan. Um, and I went to did a, a, a sort of two day course uh, where I trained. Um, I then got my results back after the end of the first day and nearly sort of fell off my chair as I sort of had to come to the realization with the person I was. Um, it's quite an, if, if you've never done a, a, a sort of a, a personality profile, do them in the right setting with the right people. Uh, I think some, some of these things can get bandied around and used, used in the wrong way, but um, they're incredibly good things to do to get a sort of more of a self-awareness. And I think as, 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 as many people have said, is the more that you're aware of who you are, the better you can be at the job that you, you do. So we do, I went and did that yes. um, over, over two days um, and then took about six months of trying to get my head around it, if I'm very honest with you. Um, the idea was literally the next day we'd start rolling out to clients um, and then we started using it internally. So actually, you know, sort of uh, with the individuals that we've got in the business and also future hires. And it was really through that that I kind of started to develop a true understanding of how to use the tool. Um, as I say, I think used in the wrong way, it can be a pretty destructive thing. Um, and and then we started rolling out to, to clients and, and had many years, I've, I've done, over, done over a thousand uh, of them myself, um, of, of giving them uh, feedback to, to clients, etc. They're, they're, they're a brilliant, brilliant thing to have uh, as, as, as a way of assessing people through a process. Fantastic. I love the suite of tools and assessments that you use to add rigor to your process on behalf of the client. I also like the coaching for 180 days after the person starts. That's a that's a brilliant idea. Um, so look, you've now been at this for 12 years or so, and you've built a really successful business in, in private equity on the buy side. Um, but what were some of the early challenges that, you know, you, that you had to figure out and overcome in order to get to where you are now. Yeah, I, I thought if if I'm if I'm honest with you, I think the through the um, Investigo um, process and then sort of co-founding another business, I thought I was pretty aware of how to start a business. Um, if I'm if I'm honest, I was completely naive, uh, <laughs> and I think I think many many people think how hard can it be um, and then they sort of head off into the uh, in, into into the sort of uh, never-ending vortex that is running your own business um, so I, I think initially just trying to shape the business get it off the ground I didn't use you know kind of any kind of um, funding to do that so it was literally success on success of, of delivery of placements and that's always difficult when you're just one person trying to sell the dream to clients of uh, what, <laughs> what you can deliver uh, and then in turn sell the dream to the people that you want to hire and build. Um, there's, a, there's an amazing guy called Daniel Priestley. I don't know if you've ever come across him. Oh, yeah. Um, I've got his book yeah. on the bookshelf back there. Yeah, he, he's, he, he's, he's a great guy. And, and there was a sort of a bit of an epiphany moment of him talking through the various different stages of the, the business. But I think just trying to scale the business has, has, has been one of the biggest challenges in that as we're trying to sort of make sure we develop this model that's really robust, the product set's really good, um, but alongside scaling scaling the business. So we, we never wanted to be a volume house, but with that comes its challenges of almost the volume does then create you know the ability or the cash flow to kind of go and scale at a, a rapid pace. So we've kind of had to take a little step back from that and make sure we get the product right. And then with that, um, the, the inflow, let's say, or the inbound of, uh, of, of, of new mandates coming through and people expecting that you're going to go through a, um, a, a retained process with us, etc., has taken a, a, bit, a bit of time. Um, what are the other challenges? Um, business planning. Um, I think the Hogan um, piece was another another key thing of just developing that self-awareness. If I'm honest, I was the classic recruiter, micromanager. Um, when we fit, when we first started the business, um, often tapped heavily on my keyboard when something went out of control and I needed to tell people about it. Um, so that was a bit of an epiphany moment doing the Hogan and, and kind of saying, okay, I need to step back from this and um, really work out who I am, what I'm about and what I want from this business. And there was a big sort of um, fundamental change from from uh, from that. Um, uh, what's the, the the five dysfunctions of a team is a great book to read around 
at, around sort of making sure you've got the strategy um, right in, in your business. But I, I would say it wasn't day one all roses and kind of um, I hear lots of these people who are like sort of sudden instant successes. It's taken a, a lot of hard work and perseverance and and just being, as I say, just wanting to kind of know more about me and what makes me tick. So then hopefully I can kind of um, then be better at what I do and, and the, the, the sort of the leader that I want to be with within the business effectively. Fantastic. So it sounds like understanding yourself and developing yourself personally, it sounds like that was key to you developing the business. You might remember back in episode 43, I talked to Plamen Ivanov, the executive chairman of iIntro. If you missed it, it's well worth going back into the archives and having a listen. One of the things we talked about was a way for recruiters to shift the conversation with prospects away from fees and make it all about value iintro has created a tool called the bad hire calculator that you can show to your prospects that proves to them that your recruitment service will save them potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars when you can do that the exact fees you charge almost become immaterial because you've proved that you will save the client the most money in the long run if you'd like to add this tool to your arsenal you'd be pleased to know that i've partnered with iintro and they're offering a 25 percent discount to listeners of the Resilient Recruiter podcast. All you have to do to claim this discount is book a free consultation and mention my name or this podcast. Just go to recruitmentcoach.com forward slash retained, follow the instructions and iintro will take care of the rest. That's recruitmentcoach.com forward slash retained. Could you elaborate please on, you said the biggest challenge was scaling the business. What, what did you mean by that? Like, what were some of the specific issues that you confronted when scaling? Yeah, so I think, I think if someone had said to me when I first started the business, um, what's your vision? I think, you know, sort of I would have been three, uh, three years, 60 people, you know, we're going we're gonna to absolutely fly. Um, and, and that's the sort of the, the element of naivety, because that takes... A, a huge amount of various different things to happen in the right order um, for for you to for you to achieve. So one element of that is luck, you know, sort of getting the market timing right, and um, and then there's other elements which are sort of general skill and an ability to kind of see and perceive where things are going to go. Um, and I think there was a, some elements, as I say, of, of the model that I was trying to create within Altus Partners was one based on reputation and um, and really sort of delivery and repeat success and that that model in the retained world takes a takes a while to substantiate and I hadn't necessarily sort of figured that that piece out um, and so initially where we thought we were going to scale very quickly that didn't necessarily happen I think the other element of of that scaling piece is it's okay for you to be able to go and pitch uh, and win a retainer but then you've got to get a model that then allows other people to do that uh, and do that well um and i was never a big fan of hiring people in from shrek firms and you know effectively getting them to do it but i did see a huge um interest from in, in individuals who've been in a contingent world who want to step up but didn't necessarily want to step back into being a researcher and doing kind of five years there before eventually they got to do the job that they'd been doing before so trying to kind of effectively be able to replicate what I was doing and then take that and, and be able to kind of implant that into other people's world and and I think that's that's now definitely in place but took took a lot longer and we've we've had someone for example who's never uh, won a retainer in their life and five weeks later they've of coming into the business they've pitched and won their first retainer so it's it's clearly working now but that took that took longer than I thought it would do. Awesome. Yeah, no, no doubt. I, I, I totally get that. <clears throat> um, so you've grown to how many people are in the business now? So we're, we're 15 people in Alta's partners. Um, and then we've got the two other, okay. two other businesses. Um, so we're 15 right. people in Alta's partners scaling to 18 by the end of the year. Um, and then we've got two other businesses, CNC search and, um, strive, which in combined total is, is 30 people. Got it. Got it. And uh, so you initially started out with no funding and you were just basically self 
you you were putting your own money into this to to get things off the ground. Um, how long until you started hiring people? Uh, it was a, it was about six months into 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 the venture okay. that I started hiring people. Um, yeah, so um, initially did that, and then sort of we, um, as I say, started to kind of build slowly from 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 there. Um, whilst we sort of really worked out the kind of the longer term vision for, for for the business. Yeah, but but I think I think that element again was one of the one of the key key lessons was you know really developing a robust people plan and knowing what that people plan looks like and why and then getting about five other people to try and take it apart if they can and um criticize and give you constructive feedback that you can then take away because again we spend as as entrepreneurs or, or sort of business leaders we probably spend a bit too much co- time convincing ourselves what we have planned is the right thing rather than actually spending lots of time you know, out there getting people to try and pull it apart if they can and, and really sort of test test the business plan in, in, in all its, uh, in all its uh, constraints, basically. Mm, all right, interesting. What does a robust, pe- a robust people plan look like? What does that, you know, kind of contain? I think just having a clear vision for the teams that you're building, the jobs that you're trying to get individuals to do, what their trajectory look like looks like so where's the sort of you know elements of promotion how you're going to keep and retain those those individuals so you've also got to sort of build in the culture the vision for for, for the for the individuals you're about to hire again sort of classic one that's overlooked we'll just hire them and then work out what we do kind of from 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 there um you know people want a clear sort of uh, direction and path that they're about to sort of go on when they join join your firm so so doing that um and then really kind of knowing what that looks like over a sort of three to five year period so again that's sort of for me a big lesson learned is if you don't have something like that in place um and it isn't tested then then you'll come a cropper when you get to sort of year two year three and you know what you're selling isn't coming as a reality um so we've we've definitely uh, done a big piece around that in the last few years, and that's that's helped majorly. Um, uh, whereas before it was a it was a sort of a little looser and lots of sort of big pipeline vision of where we were going to get to. Um, but as I say, probably not enough um, rigor around it, um, and and certainly I've noticed with getting outside influence and board members and you know, uh, getting other people to comment and, and sort of feedback, which we never want to hear, but, but is, is, is the best way to really sort of test something like a people plan and, and work out whether actually what you're saying is, you know, you've got a good, good ability to, uh, to, to meet those demands. Got it. Okay. Interesting. So you mentioned, um, one of the challenges was sort of replicating what you're doing. You know, you're able to go out and pitch and win retained searches, but then getting, you know, some other people in the business to be able to do that as well. So how did you, how did you achieve that? I think it comes, comes through two, two elements, training, um, and, Mm -hmm. and also giving them the infrastructure and product base that effectively an individual would use, um, in, in that pitch process. So they've got the tools to go and sort of sit and work through effectively a process that, that you would go through as a, as a normal, um, but they've got all of those tools to go and kind of go and deliver based on that, um, Again, I think the the other element of, of really making sure that that is robust so they don't get caught out if they get asked a difficult question. Um, and then the other, I think the other aspect is, is making it a normal part of the business practice. So as soon as people start to see it as a kind of regular occurrence and not this big, you know, kind of pipe dream of, yeah, we'll go and win retainers and all is going to be well, is actually seeing that you deliver upon that time and time again, um, gives them the confidence to go and sort of, you know, talk to clients about about why they should be retained um, or why they should be in a retained process, which I firmly believe is is the right way to, to you know, approach a search. Um, but if you've got that confidence, then that sort of then feeds through to the individuals you're asking to go out and, again, pitch for that retainer. Absolutely. Great explanation, Ed. I think I agree 100%. There's three keys that you highlighted. One is um, 
having that product set because a lot, I would say 95% of recruitment businesses sell on personality and mm. not the actual process or the product that they're delivering to the client. So therefore you get these characters going out with like, who are outgoing and, you know, extroverted and are able to talk the talk and so on. And, you know, but that's not something you can really scale a business based upon, you know, uh, upon that. And so if you're a founder and you are good at winning business, that's not going to translate, you know, into somebody else coming along and being able to replicate that. So you need to have a product to sell that anybody in the business could sell and the differentiators associated with that. Second, of course, is training. You know, we need to give people the skills to be able to, um, you know, follow a, a solution selling or consultative selling uh, model. But third, and equally, if not most important, is the confidence and the belief, you know, that and all, and making this normal, you said this just has to be normal, people just uh, do it because that's the way we do it here, right? It's just the normal thing. Mm -hmm. It's not exceptional or unique or, or difficult. It's just this is the way we work. And this is normal. And instilling that belief and having those references available or examples or, you know, role models available within the business, I think is, is key. You said you firmly believe that retained is the best solution for the client in most cases. Why do you say that? Um, because I think recruitment done well is, is a partner led approach. You should be their in house talent manager that they don't want to sort of hire on a full time basis. So someone who truly understands the, the business, but also is about to go on a journey. And as we all know, um, recruitment is fraught um, with challenges. Um, you're trying to sell and uh, get someone over the line that has an unlimited amount of variables of things that can change and go wrong and all that other stuff. So if you don't do that in a retained process, you're not giving the firm the confidence to go and do the background work. Um, and I just, I just think in today's world where seemingly no matter what the kind of macro challenges are of you know, pandemics, etc., people, there's, there's so much appetite to hire um, and people want the best talent. So, to do that by virtue of just getting a few CVs from people and hoping you pick the best one, I think is is not necessarily putting that greater process or make, making it that sophisticated. Um, however, if you go through a retained process, you pick a firm that you really truly believe in and uh, have confidence in their process of assessment, um, then you will find the best talent out there. And as I say, even though you might meet a few challenges along the way, you will have both bought into that partnership process and, and then come out the delivery. Um, so we, we purposely weight a lot of our fees around success. So we can still talk to um, clients about the fact that we're, we're aligned. Both of us want the end result. Um, uh, but it, but again, it's it's about having that partnership approach and both buying into that that fact that we are going to go through uh, a few bumps along the road, but we we will get them. We'll get the very best individual because we've done it in the correct way. Hundred percent agree. That was a great explanation, Ed. And you, I love the word partnership. It's one I use a lot in our coaching program, which you know implies to me that you are collaborating as an equal on an equal footing with your client, you're both working together to achieve the desired outcome. And whereas so often, and what can be frustrating in contingency, in addition to all the variables that you mentioned, that you can't control and things that can go wrong, is being held at arm's length and, and almost treated like as an adversary rather than a, an ally in the process, which you know, makes it seem like an uphill battle to try and actually help the, the client. Um, so yeah, I love that. Now, you also mentioned something earlier, which was the challenge of getting the ball rolling when you don't have that market reputation. And you almost can't like, point to it's a bit of a chicken and egg scenario, right? Because you're trying to win retained work, but you don't have a lot of case studies or references to point to. Um, how did you kind of negotiate that and get, you know, get the ball rolling down the hill? 
Yeah, I think the the interesting thing, I, I personally think people are starting to see through um, case studies and testimonials as, as, as sort of marketing literature more than something they can really, truly value and um, put a lot of weight on. So we don't we, do, we don't place a heavy emphasis on on that. Um, we can, you know, big clients can, of course, get references, etc. Um, if, if they wish, but it'd be weird if you gave them a reference or a point of contact with a reference that wasn't wasn't you know, glowing about your business. So actually, I think it's more around the product set and, and how you demonstrate that your process is going to be the best one and the one that they want to, you know, work with you on. Um, so I would say for any any firm that is, is looking to develop a, um, a good, robust, retained approach, it's really about working on that and, and, and testing that and, and, and putting that in place. I do think you, you kind of, if you've never done it before, you, you need to start small and work big. Um, so start start putting in place sort of smaller retainer fees and, and, and working working on scaling scaling those once you've developed some some element of track record. But really, it just yeah, recruitment. You know, it is a fairly simplistic beast, um, but you can do a lot to it. Um, uh, I think you only need to if you um, the book Laszlo Block's work rules is is amazing he's he was the head of hiring for google if you if you read uh work rules i mean that that's google's approach to hiring but clearly just thought and thought and thought about again the process of getting the best talent um and that's the the, the way to kind of go about your own processes internally is actually what do we do start to finish and how can we better that process and then how to, how can we show clients that's the process that we go go through and as soon as clients see that level of rigor then there you can see them naturally warming and buying into the into the process um, rather than necessarily listening to a wonderful sales pitch. You're obviously a big reader. I actually have a book club for my clients. Uh, you've given th three titles so far. Any other favorite business books that you recommend? Do you know what, Mark? I'm not a business uh, a good good reader at all. I'm a horrendous reader, um, but 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 I but I, I forced myself to 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 read. Um, I wasn't I wasn't the the most academic person at school, but I've I've really forced myself to read. And actually, it's um, uh, a couple of people that that sort of um, pushed the the fact that you're going to get so much from 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 doing that and and really then I mean I I personally digest books best in audible format so you know listening to them on the tube or the commute or at home for an hour is is far far better but s since I've d done that it's I mean yeah uh, what what a plonker for not reading not not really reading sooner is all I can say so I think some of the uh, um, the individuals that work for me often get tired of the fact that I now I'm like a convert. So, you know, sort of, I'm, you have to read, you have to read, you have to read. Um, uh, I, I think one of the best books to read is if you haven't read a lot before, um, Stephen Covey, the seven habits of highly effective people. That's just brilliant and does a lot around kind of goals and looking at both personal and business um, set up so uh, which obviously as recruiters we're hugely emotionally uh, emotional people and um, and and the two do go hand in hand if you've had an argument with your wife or your girlfriend or husband or boyfriend that typically comes into work so that's there's quite a good one um, from 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 both perspectives um, and I really like this this thing called uh, Daniel Priestley books um, key person of influence that's another good read. Um, and the personal MBA by Josh Kaufman um, is a really, really great one for understanding, you know, your product set and what you're trying to deliver and how you're going about it and covering all the all the, all the topics um, topics well. I'll stop there. As you can see, I'm, a combat. I'm like one of those people that starts overly <laughs> preaching to... <laughs> No, that's great. This you're preaching to the converted here. So that thanks, Ben. And there's some titles there I hadn't uh, hadn't come across. So I will add them to my Audible uh, wish list. So thanks for that. Any other <clears throat> hard won suggestions or advice for companies that do want to scale? In terms of like, you know, from your own experience, what you found difficult and what you've then learned from and had to put things in place. 
Yeah, I think it's it's the the planning element. So typically, as in the, so if you're going to start a recruitment firm, generally speaking, you're going to be a, a salesperson or recruiter before before that. Inherently, what goes hand in hand with that is individuals that don't like planning and that um, are often don't like the administration piece. Um, and that's the bit that I would give advice to to anyone is go make sure you go back and do that. Put it put it together, put your financials together, really good business plan. Then go and take that out to four or five people you know and trust, um, but also, you know, business successes in their own right. Don't be afraid of hearing what you don't want to hear um, and, and working on that business plan um, time and time again. But just don't rush into it. I, I did. And, and that's what I got wrong. Um, and I didn't do enough rigor at the start. And that ultimately cost me further down the line in terms of sort of the years it took me to build what I thought I should have been building before that. Um, but I think those those are the, the kind of key things. Just just before you want to charge head headlong in something, which are, again, as, as salespeople are great at doing, um, just stop, think, work it out, work it out. Um, and then work out plan B and C if they don't, you know, if something in the world changes and, and that doesn't come come to, to fruition. Um, yeah, and don't believe your own hype. I think that's the other key thing is just, you know, you, <laughs> if, if, if you've thought it's about started a, starting a business, you're, you, you feel you're good enough, um, which is great. And, and absolutely, it's a hell of a journey to go through. But I think, um, you know, all, all power to you. Um, but just, just then just become hugely humble. And just say, okay, I just need to, I need to work out every aspect of things and how it's going to look. Um, you know, people planning all of that other stuff, um, and and then and then start on your journey when you feel really confident that you've got something that you can refer back to. And and I think that's the key thing is, you know, we all go off do our thing, and then you need something when you're kind of questioning everything to kind of go back to and say, what is it that I planned? What is it that we set out to do? Is that right? And then you kind of a you can gain confidence for having that that piece of you know information in place basically okay fantastic yeah definitely the planning i of course there's a balance because you can plan forever and never take action right so you know yep, i think some of that uh some of that just drive to start things without necessarily having thought everything through i think is necessary to some extent in order to even have the confidence to to launch something but then if you never go back and actually do the planning piece then there's, you're not going to achieve at the level that you might otherwise have for sure yeah you can't you can't hide behind it it's something that make make the planning part the thing that stops you from doing it definitely not um but in that planning part you should have key clear dates and milestones that you're going to set yourself and hold yourself accountable to um, and then they might be part of the feedback that you get is, is that realistic or, you know, should that be this date, et cetera. But then you've got to obviously go and deliver on that. And if, if you've got a couple of people that we, if you've got a couple of people that have read a business plan or become board members, the great thing about that is then you are invariably holding yourself to account because they are sure as hell going to you know ask you in six months. So how are you doing against that? And, and again, sort of, naturally speaking to the ego slightly you don't want to feel like you've you've not delivered on what you've promised basically fantastic absolutely and having that sounding board and the you know advice i think is important as well in fact um a friend of mine joel slenning and i are starting a program for seven figure recruiting firms who want to scale to eight figures and um i had joel on the show a few months ago, if for those listening who want to catch up on that, it was episode 53 on how to scale your recruiting and staffing firm. He, he scaled his to $16 million and then sold it. Um, and so he and I are collaborating and we're putting this 12-month uh, program together for recruitment entrepreneurs. So any listeners who want to find out more about that is recruitmentcoach.com forward slash scale. And you can get uh, access to or you can register for a free sort of taster session webinar that uh, Joel and I are, are, are running. Um, so yeah, Ed, to, to, in, in, the to next empower, go ahead. I was going to say to empower that Mark, I, w I would say if, if you can, if you get, you know, whether they're mentors or coaches, et cetera, to support what you're doing, 
absolutely uh, i think that's a, that's a, a brilliant thing to have um again especially if it's just you as the the business owner having some kind of outside support that you can um you can lean on um or that spells out the obvious that you've just missed i mean we, we we've all been there and done that that's a that's a great thing to have I've sold Fantastic. I've sold your business said, for you, yeah. Mark. So. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you very much. So then you already had a search firm that was doing well in the private equity space. Why did you then start another firm with your sister Lucy Chamberlain in 2016? Um, you know, as if you didn't already have enough uh, to do. What what motivated that? Yeah, I think I think I, I get very restless, um, and I'm constantly thinking of new ideas. Probably one of the um, uh, if I if I look at life experience of, of running a business, it's also some of the, one of the things I've had to temper quite a lot because um, again, people don't generally like change. So when you're coming up with new ideas all the time and and telling them that that's what you're gonna you do as a firm, that's not particularly helpful. Um, but also from my own sort of personal health, I'm um, trying to try to <laughs> do to do too much is um, is is not necessarily a good thing. But this this was too good an opportunity to turn down. So it's actually um, again sort of didn't necessarily learn my lesson from the first first experience of mixing business with pleasure. But um, Lucy, my sister, had had been a part of. Um, another recruitment firm she's she's a you know, classic case of never thought I'd go into recruitment and then someone else suggested it and hence here we are um but she had suggested getting into recruitment she was with with that firm uh, and had done exceptionally well there but felt that she needed a new challenge and if I if I'm honest um, and probably rightly she she sort of wanted didn't necessarily want to kind of go and do it on her own and build from scratch so we already had the Altus Partners business. The the only weakness to building a retained only firm is that you don't have interim or contract staff coming through your books. So um, uh, that's another lesson learned. Um, that the sort of recurring revenue model is quite a good one. Um, but effectively within her market, which was HR and, and, and support staff, there was there was a chance of of gaining um, a lot more in terms of that recurring revenue and having a lot more sort of temporary staff as part of what they did. We had a real shared ethos and vision of what good looked like and what we wanted the businesses to look like and how we wanted to treat employees and 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 um, you know what we what we wanted to kind of grow the firm to. Um, would would you know, sort of driven in the same same way. So effectively, anyway, after a after a few conversations, which ended after the about the fifth call, where I actually said, right, are you going to do this thing or not? <laughs> I've spent a year trying to convince you. Um, she she sort of agreed and, and we put the, the plan together for CNC search, um, uh, which has gone on to be a, a great success. So really looking at that particular market and saying, actually, you know, what, what that market is about is building communities and, and a tribe of individuals that that really, you know, kind of uh, want to grow and do do better. And so um, effectively started the CNC business and, 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 and built it from from there to the I would definitely say success it is today. Could you, what do you mean by community led recruiting and building like minded tribes? Yeah, so the, the, the sort of business support um, and HR world um, is, is, a, is a unique market where, in effect, there's a lot of individuals that are interested in helping each other out in sort of understanding better ways of doing things are interested in um you know coaching and training etc and and so the market that um, cnc sits within has always predominantly been quite staid and you know lots of people sort of stiff up a lip and you know very old school in in approach um what we wanted to do with cnc is is say well actually no this 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 is a community of individuals that want to know each other and do more together so it was really talking to them firstly in the right way so they actually understood you know we we wanted that as well and then bringing those networks and communities together um and really kind of leveraging upon that so um building forums networking groups coaching groups training groups all of the things that that market really wanted and demanded um, and then through that, sort of using that as the premise for success. So very different to the Altus Partners model and, and private equity, which is 
different in the setup of networks and communities and things that it wants to create and it's much more about single mindedness you know and, and sort of determination and you know all this this other stuff um that the cnc market is, is very different so we wanted to make sure we spoke to that audience in the right way basically great so by community you're including your employees plus your candidates plus your clients it, it are all part of this community that you're building and you 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 sort of rattled off a list there, but can you give an example of how you've built that community, um, you know, around CNC search, and then what the benefit has been? Yeah, so initially we we started um, with networking groups, um, and then from that became giving those networking groups. Um, training um, and when I say training not there's there's different forms for me of, of training there's stuff that's sort of arbitrary and token gestures and then there's other stuff that you really invest in um, and Lucy has gone on to become a great trainer in her own right um, but by virtue of bringing in outside influence and people who've got unique perspectives but the, the, also the, the key things that um, that are important to that market for example in business support often the individuals that sit within that market are, are not very well respected and they're undervalued and underappreciated so we we were saying well actually that's that's wrong and how do we help um with um with getting them the tools that they need to go and do better in in in, in their businesses um so effectively we brought them together under that umbrella uh, under a umbrella where we were saying well let, let's give that community what they really want and need to make their careers a success and then from from that platform they can go and do do better and, and naturally obviously it as i say it's a, a, a largely a word of mouth community so then you kind of really build a reputation for for doing that rather than just being about you know sort of wanting to put them in one job to another and then another job to another and really not care about where their career is going. So um, again, going back to the reputation piece, which is a sh shared goal for me and Lucy is, well, we do care about where they're going and what they're doing. Um, and so if we can empower that and support that, that's a, that's a great thing to do to bring, bring everyone together um, in one sort of tribe or network or community. Fantastic. So when you say networking groups, you're talking about groups that you actually started not attending other people's networking groups is this a group that you've kind of or you and lucy created for your clients and candidates or yeah absolutely so they, they kind of came as hubs so they were either seminars and deliveries that we did internally as kind of with outside training or we'd bring certain subsets together and um discuss you know, kind of key, relevant, important information to, to that community. Um, but it right. was always under underpinned by training and development as being the kind of core to what brought everyone together um, and, and wanting to enhance got their, it, got it. their careers. Yeah, no, look, this is brilliant. And I actually think it applies to most markets. It could be, you know, not just HR and business support. I think this, I, and this is something I've really noticed over the last couple of years that many of the best recruiting businesses have have started to incorporate is this idea of creating communities and adding value to your industry that you serve uh, in a deeper way than just the transactional, you know, uh, placement, you know, putting someone in a job or what have you. Um, so for your groups, it's essentially you're bringing people together, you're hosting events, which have an element of networking and, and peer support, but also an element of learning and development and, and professional development. Um, could you, I, I believe that during the pandemic, you pivoted and actually made the training uh, into a key pillar of the business. Could you describe uh, what that process involved? Yeah, so it's, I mean, um, we were really hard hit within CNC because one of the core markets that we we served was was office based. So, um, and and unfortunately, and and badly so, seen as an overhead. So naturally, um, 
uh, that, that that market pretty much shut down over, overnight. Um, and we literally had our record quarter um, for CNC going into, into the pandemic. Um, and so we sort of sat there in this moment of going, oh my God, what, what next? And, and like all of us probably worrying about our livelihoods and all the rest of it. Um, and, and really it was a crystallization of every, everything we'd done before um, in, 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 and making that sort of available online in effect. So we put together something called the CNC Academy, um, which was, I mean, I, I've never done video editing, but I suddenly had, found myself, you know, kind of at 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night, sort of video editing uh, uh, these various different things to put together an online. Um, yeah, funny enough, I've moved away from I've moved away from that quite quickly as well, Mark. I sort of understand your skill set, and that probably was it was all right, but it was wasn't necessarily my strongest uh, skill set. So, um, but we put together the CNC Academy, and it was really the manifestation again, sort of. Um, career-based uh, development and, and training um, and obviously in that particular point in time where people were losing their jobs resonated a lot um, we give, gave a load of those courses away to people that really needed it because they were trying to get it back into work um, we formalized certifications for certain um, pieces of the training that we were doing so it again showed that people weren't sitting idly if they'd lost their job they were sh they were you know trying to learn and develop and improve themselves and they could then take those certificates to employers to show that they um, they they had effectively achieved something in 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 the time that they were out of work, um, and also people who are in work who are trying to deal with you know sort of a whole load of other stuff and um, again you know sort of how how do they get better at, at that and meet meet those challenges? Um, so yeah, we, we put together the academy and it absolutely flew. I mean, I think obviously really resonated with the market. Uh, I think we've got sort of over five thousand courses taken um in a very short space of time wow. so yeah so it was it was a, it was a great success but also felt like we were we were doing something that really we'd been doing for a while and it was just a sort of culmination of that point so it also didn't feel unnatural or we were just trying to do something to kind of earn a bit of money it was it was genuinely sort of bringing bring something together that we'd already been already been doing or looking at Fantastic. You were already sort of heading down that path and then the, the pandemic was really a catalyst for you formalizing it and doing it at a much bigger scale, it sounds like. Um, and I believe you, you attracted corporate clients as well. Um, I've, you, you, in your notes, Amazon, Warner Brothers, Sony, Campbell's Soups. How did that, and how did that happen? Yeah, I think, I think like we've gone through this weird very quick cycle i would say with the pandemic so um like anything i think if you think your business is brilliant today just be conscious of what it's going to be tomorrow and 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 trying to you know constantly improve and better and adapt and change so for us with the academy absolutely soared obviously everyone off off um off or sort of not in the office and working from home etc and all the rest of it and then naturally as things have hopefully got a bit better um people are starting to return to the office i think we're all a little bit webinared out um love a podcast don't worry mark but um i think you know sort of in terms of actual <laughs> webinars we've all, we've all probably done one too many of those so the market started to shift and change and really sort of said well okay actually we're becoming you know we've got quite demanding work pressures and things like that so as part of that we wanted to continue that journey and really for us the next step was elevating that into corporate clients and obviously, because we'd done a huge amount of the work there already, um, we could take that product and take it to the next level and then kind of deliver it uh, across corporate clients. Um, and so we, we sort of effectively looked at that as being the next step for that, the, the academy um, uh, and, and taking that, that product and, and being able to kind of package it so corporates could continue the training and development um, that, that we'd already been offering to, to single individuals, basically. Amazing. That sounds, that's so cool. Um, so then your latest venture ad, I believe you is a software company or an applicant tracking system. What prompted you to, to do, go down that road? Because there, it's a very competitive space. There's already a lot of, you know, good established players in that. Why bother to try and create your own ATS? Still asking myself the same question, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Oh God. Um, so I think 
as 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 many recruiters will know, we we've all dealt with applicant tracking systems in our time. I've I've I'm yet to hear sort of too many many favourable things about them. And when I talk about applicant tracking systems, I'm not talking about the ATS that you might use for recruitment companies to recruit. Um, I sort of yeah, you're sort of built in CRM or anything else like that. I'm talking more about the end, the companies themselves, and the, the software that they use and. And so I think for, for me, I often felt really frustrated at, you know, what that software looked like. And uh, when we were asked to use it by clients, you know, how that actually meant that it was increasing the amount of time that people were spending in the process. Often they were circumnavigated. So you could just get emails directly to and fro. And, you know, there's the ATS in the background that someone said, oh, by the way, can you fill that in? Because we have to do that because of business protocol and all the rest of it. So I said there must be a better way of doing this. Um, also for us as a business to to scale, you know, um, I was looking at our own processes and saying, well, there must be a better way to do that. And then I went out and looked at ATSs for us as a, as a business, as Altus Partners in CNC, and realised actually the offerings were really expensive for our type of company. And so I thought, well, okay, there, there, there's perhaps an opportunity here for, for, for that. Um, and so that was the idea of Strive, and t- that was about two years ago. Um, and then really worked and worked again at sort of the business planning, ironically. It took much longer this time to, 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 to come to fruition. So about a year of planning and testing, working out what the market need, needed. And, and for us, our three core pillars around time, compliance and engagement being the three factors. Um, and then understanding a market, which is that sort of fast growing SME businesses who need a great solution for hiring, but they don't want to go and pay 10, 15, 20 grand off the bat to go and get that. Um, so th- literally for Strive, you can sign up for 20 quid and you know, you're off and running and, and you can start making hires through that. So really um, a good level of access- accessibility. Um, and then, and then for the last year, we've been building the product, um, which has been a yeah, it's been an eye opener in terms of sort of working out how technology work works. Realizing technology is a completely different world in itself, with its own dictionary seemingly of, of various different terms and words that people use. Um, but I'm delighted to say that we're launching the beta product in September, and people can go and. You know, go to strive.online and, and, and pay for this product. We've, we've made two hires in three weeks through it in the alpha testing phase. So I know its value and, and what, what it can do for, for growing businesses. Fantastic. So just for clarification, now, you're not talking about the recruiting software that we use internally as a recruitment agency or a search firm. You're talking about on the client side, what software they use to facilitate and uh, track their hiring process. So you're specifically aiming at fast growing, small and medium sized enterprises, uh, I, I take it. Um, and you mentioned uh, those, what are those three pillars again? The, um, compliance? So, yeah, so yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll test you, Mark. Um, no, it's, it's, it's time, <laughs> which is the time reduction that you spend. So reducing the admin, the amount of time you spend around around that. Compliance, which is things like GDPR, yeah, etc., um, and legal compliance, um, and then engagement. So, actually, again, a big piece for us with all of these systems, they often look quite grey, pretty uninteresting places to be or want to operate within. Um, so, how do we enhance that engagement um, and, and go go through that? Um, and also things like sort of user rewards and making people want to engage with the platform. Ironically, another part is the community part. So people's got platform to talk about hiring issues, their challenges they face, and sort of you know bring bring all of the, all of that to, to, together as well. So that's the the idea. So you could, you could also have it as a recruitment company who are looking to scale and want an ATS to manage your hiring process because you know we we've got it ourselves with a an applicant tracking system that's uh, or a search software tool that's great for that but way too complicated for you know someone looking to to to, to hire hire someone or put in a process for 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 that piece so it actually has a, a sort of very different function to the one that we would typically use as as a recruitment company fantastic well it sounds exciting so the website for that is strive.online and it's strive s t r y v e dot online well listen 
You've got a lot of exciting projects uh, and, and businesses you're involved in, Edward. So, um, you know, good luck with the launch of Strive. And uh, hopefully you. we can do this again and catch up on new developments and new accomplishments um, in the future. Excellent. Really appreciate your time, Mark.